prayer. We're glad that you're here. If you open up your Bibles to the book of 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, a couple of housekeeping notes before we begin. I did not see her tonight. Clarissa Swafford, of course, just lost her, uh, her mother. And if you could uh, maybe give her a phone call this week, don't know that she'll be at home. Or you can send her a text message or I think she's on Facebook. Or just a how you do. She's having a, as you can expect, a tough time. with lost her mom. Uh, of course, she's living over there and just, you know, moving stuff back to her house. And stuff. She's having a tough time with that. So if you could do that, that'd be great. Just show uh, your appreciation and uh, attention to her. Help her get through this. Also, uh, our own Larry, Larry Lockhart, will be having some surgery on October the 26th. Now, that is a Thursday, and uh, I know that he would appreciate your prayers. And, uh, it's one of those things where they say there's nothing to it, but, you know, uh, lickety split, and you'll be done, and uh, you know how I feel about such things. Minor surgery for everybody else is major surgery when it's you, right? So remember him. We're thankful that... Uh, getting this done. It, uh, Larry has a family history of aneurysms and uh, it's good to be able to uh, look those, get those things taken care of. Also, I talked with Janet Thomas this afternoon. They were going up. can't remember if it was Jim's birthday or an anniversary or whatever. They were going up to uh, Dayton to see uh, the grandbaby and uh, I guess they'll probably see Bentley too while they're there, but you know, mainly uh, Jim and Jane. But uh, Continue to pray for him as he uh, continues to struggle. He's having a lot of weakness in, in his leg. And also, my son has a birthday tomorrow, as well as, can you believe it or not, Macy is turning, is it 15, Macy? I know better. It's 16 years old. Can you believe that? It, yeah, I know. It's, it's a scary, ain't it, Charles? Charles is doing the old driving thing over there. So, uh, but that that's great. We're happy. For you. 16, that's a, I remember I could not wait to get my driver's license. Basically, I remember coming home, got my driver's license, asked my stepdad for the keys, he gave them to me, I went out, got in the car, drove down the end of the block, we had a red light at the end of the street, and had no idea which way to go. I had nowhere to go, I just wanted to go, I probably rode around about 30 minutes or something, and went back home, you know, but it's just the idea of being free, but you know, it changed a whole lot. 2 Corinthians is basically an argument about the Apostle Paul and his uh, being an apostle. He has been attacked as uh, you can see touches of it in 1 Corinthians, but in 2 Corinthians, that whole thing, to save uh, chapters 8 and 9, is Paul saying, I am an apostle. You know I'm an apostle. You've seen the work. Because there are these people inside the church at Corinth who are trying to say that Paul's not what he is and that everybody there ought to listen to them. And so that's the context that we're going to find our passage tonight that we're going to kind of build our, our, uh, our sermon around. He says in verse uh, chapter 13, verse 1, this is the third time I'm coming to you in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Uh, let every word be established, you know. He's going to come there and set the record straight. He says in verse 3, since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, which is to you where it is not weak, but is mighty in you. In other words, you're saying I don't have the power of Christ, that my preaching's weak and you're preaching. He's getting after these guys now who are saying he's not an apostle. And he's saying, you say you, you're all powerful and I'm not. Well, we'll see when I get there. <clears throat> he says, verse 4, for though, we, he has, excuse me, for though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. In other words, everybody thought they had Jesus whooped. They thought that was weakness that got him crucified. It wasn't. It was actually the power of God being exercised. He says, well, we are also weak in him. But, he, but we shall live with him by the power of God towards you. And then he says something, examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. In other words, take a look at your own self, prove your own selves, uh, know ye not uh, your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobate. In other words, he's saying, examine yourself, make sure that you're what you say you are, of course they are not, and then he says not only that, but prove it, just like in Christianity, we're to prove all things and hold fast to that which is true. So examine these, these false teachers. He's telling them, you take a look at yourself. And you examine yourself. Well, I don't think any of us here 
or going around preaching false doctrine. But I think a passage that's just as that, probably more applicable, is, is to, uh, for us, would be in 1 Corinthians. Let's take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And this is dealing with the taking of the Lord's Supper. This is instructions about that. He kind of gets after them in the beginning there, talking about when they come together, they're not doing that correctly. This is 1 Corinthians 11, uh, about verse 18. When you come together in the church, I hear there's divisions among you. When you come together in one place, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper. He's, he's rebuking them there. It should have been for that purpose, but it's not. He says, if we're in everyone, uh, you know, uh, in eating, everyone taketh before others his own supper. One is hungry, another is drunken. Now, that doesn't mean intoxicated. That means saturated. In other words, they have plenty to drink with their food, their meal, but other, people's are, other people are going without. And that's when he rebukes them and says, don't you have houses to eat and drink in? This, you know, this is something that you shouldn't be doing. You shouldn't be mistreating each other. And then he's going to talk about the taking of the Lord's Supper. Verse 24, we're familiar with these verses. He says, uh, he, he gave thanks, the Lord did, he break it, take the eat, this is my body, do this in remembrance of me. Uh, after the same manner, he took the cup when he had supped, this cup, my, this is the new, the cup of the new, is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. So we say in verse 24, kind of a mini sermon, that in verse 24, we look back at the cross. In uh, verse uh, 26 there, we're looking forward to the Lord's return. But in verse 27, he says, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the Lord and the blood of the Lord. So we're to look inwardly, look back at the cross, look to the coming of the Lord, but also notice verse 28. But let a man, ah, there's our word again, examine himself. In other words, take inventory, if you will. See if we are what we ought to be. And hence, that's going to be our lesson theme tonight as we talk about examining yourself. Examine yourself. And of course, we've already read this particular verse. That's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to look at it from five different points. First of all, it must be about me. It must be personal. I've got to examine old Ron Gilbert. You see, Ezekiel 18.20 teaches us the soul that sinned. It shall die. I am not going to be able to say, hey, you know what? My dad wasn't what he ought to be. And therefore, I didn't get the kind of training that I should have. And so, well, it's on him. And God ought to give me a pass. It's not what the Lord says. He says, the son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Each of us will give an account of our life, not the circumstances around it. It'll be how... We handled that. Wow, I'm not even on the screen. Did I even put my computer? I did log in, didn't I? Wasn't it up there at one point? You know, brethren, it's a hard thing getting older. I sure thought that uh, I was logged in. I think I'm logged in. Can anybody back there, am I logged in, Jerry? I am not. Well, that's okay. Maybe somebody can stand up here with some cue cards and hold them up as we go. We'll give it a shot again. Hey, that looks a little better. Sorry about that. Here I am just going to town. You know, y'all can stop me and say, uh, Ron, it's, uh, there's nothing going on up there. Uh, you feel free to do that. You will not uh, hurt my feelings any. There we go. So we're going to talk about it must be personal, Ezekiel 18.20. 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now notice the verbiage of this sentence. That everyone may receive the things done in his body according that he hath done. That's how, what you've done. Whether it be good or bad, you're going to receive of that. Now, how is a way that we can get out of that? How can we get out of giving account of the things that we've done bad in our bodies? Anybody? Speak up. You're not, what was that, Corey? Don't do them. There's one. But what happens if you've already done them? What do you got to do now? Well, you got to fix it, don't you? What do you got to do? You got to be washed in the blood of the Lamb, right? 
You got to obey the gospel. Be washed. What happens to those things done in the body then? What happens with those sins? What's that? They're taken as far as the east is from the west. They're hidden behind a cloud, if you will. They're taken to the bottom of the sea. They will not come up again. God forgives you of those sins. They're gone. But if not, if you haven't had your sins washed away by the blood of the Lamb, if you are in your sins, if you're an erring child of God and you're not walking in the light, getting that to continuous cleansing, you'll still have those. Also, Romans 14, 12, So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. This is individual responsibility. You will not get to heaven on the coattails of the South Pittsburgh Church, nor will I. I won't get to coattails on any of my teachers. I will have to give an account of what I have done how well I have listened to the Lord and done the things that he's told me that I need to do, just as you will too. Matthew 25, 31 and 32, the Bible says, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory with all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. We're going to see Jesus. He's going to come back, with the First Thessalonians says, with his angels. We're going to be reunited with him. First Thessalonians chapter 4. Notice verse 32, and before him shall be gathered all nations. This is talking about the great judgment. And he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. Notice that. The sheep, the goats, all nations shall be gathered together before him. The wicked and the just. I know our premillennial friends, our denominational friends, believe they're not going to be there. But they're going to have that seven-year tribulation, thousand-year kingdom, and they'll have the, the great white throne judgment. They're not going to have to go through the judgment we're talking about. Bible says, because everybody's going to be there. Well, let's go on. This examination must also be continual. It must be always. You, you're never going to get to a point in Christianity until you die where you can say, you know what, I've done my time. I think now I can just kind of kick back on my laurels and I will be good to go. That is not how this works. 1 Corinthians 9, 27, Paul the Apostle, you know how he loved his metaphors. He starts in verse 24 talking about boxing and fighting and so forth. And then he gets to verse 27 and says, I keep my body and bring it into, there should be a separation there, that was like a wild word, it into subjection, lest by that any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. The, the, if you were to look at this literal, the idea of bring it under literally means to beat black and blue. It's a boxing term. And one of the interesting things about this, you remember the woman who wouldn't leave that judge alone, the widow woman? And she just bugged the fire. And this judge didn't care about God. He didn't care about man. But this widow was pestering him to death. And he says, you know what? I'm going to give judgment on her case. But if I don't, she, she's going to, in other words, we look at that as nagging. But that's not what it says. The idea there is that she's going to beat me black and blue. Same, same idea here. So 1 Corinthians 9, 27, Paul the apostle who's preached to others, who is an apostle, who's done the works of the apostle, says, I've got to take care of myself. Lest when I have preached to others, I should be a castaway. So you don't ever attain to a certain level and say, okay, well, I'm done now. Got to keep going. James 1, 25, but whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and notice the verbiage, and continueth therein. It's not a one and done. It is a lifestyle. It is a life of discipleship. It is a life that I must continue to do the work that he would have me to do. 1 John 1, 7 of sermon a verse that I learned to quote many many years ago didn't understand it as I understand it today learned it at uh, Camp Joy which was a uh, Highland Parks Baptist Church's uh, summer camp named after a young child of uh, the, the preacher there who had died her name was Joy and so I learned uh, 1 John chapter 1 verses 5 through 10 memorize that then I could quote it to you now but I'm just saying it's a good thing encourage your young people Memorize scripture, something you'll take with you the rest of your life. It's a good thing. I remember reading one time of uh, Alexander Campbell and his father, one of the, excuse me, his, yes, his father and his mother would discipline him. Now, this was you know, long before he came to America, and I'm not saying because he started Church of Christ or anything. Alexander Campbell was just a good guy, a good man, very smart man. But one of the things his parents would do when he would get into some trouble, he'd do some things, they'd tell him, you know, he didn't do his chores or whatever they would make him memorize a proverb that dealt with that particular thing that he had let, you know, let go. Uh, you know, maybe he thought something was right and it wasn't. They'd give him a proverb, you know, uh, there is a way which seems right and dumb man, but then there are the ways of death, Proverbs 14, 12. And so the scripture that he learned, 
dealt with the particulars of what he was trying to grow up and be. So notice this says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, notice, his son cleanseth us from all sins. If you look at the, it's the same in the English. If you look in the Greek, it's talking about something that's ongoing. And as long as I'm walking, I'm cleansed. The blood of Jesus is continually cleansing me. I have heard people say, you know, and, and really deal, have a hard time with, you know, you're going down the road, somebody pulls out in front of you, you say a cuss word or something, and you get T-boned by a transfer truck and you die. You know, well, you know, no sin will go into heaven, and there you were sinning, you know, you're going to be lost. Folks, if you're walking in the light and you make a, a momentary lapse of judgment or something of that nature, God is not going to cast you away uh, forever because of something uh, like that. Now, I'm not saying that you can live your life any way that you want to, but as Brother Paul Kidwell used to say, some, some in the church have developed a theology that we've either got to live a perfect life or die praying, and that is simply not the case. But I'm not saying you can't you can do whatever you want to any time, but you have to walk in the light, and that's a lifestyle, and all of us know that have lived the Christian life from day to day, from time to time, you're going to make mistakes. Does God reject you? Do we go from saved to unsaved three or four times a day? You know, we have a halo on our head one minute, and the next time we're sitting there uh, smoking with a pitchfork in our hand. That's not the way it works. And we need to be careful and realize that a passage like this is teaching, as long as we're trying to live that life, God is going to uh, cleanse us from all sins. Notice Revelation 2.10, the last part of it. Be thou faithful unto death, unto death, up and until the point of death. And Jesus said, I will give thee, talking to the... Uh, uh, church at Smyrna there, the crown of life, which is certainly applicable to us. It's not something we can just stop and not uh, continue in. Number three, we must make sure as we're examining ourselves that we are uh, doing so by the right standard. Uh, talking with a man yesterday whose uh, wife actually traveled around with Mitt Romney when he was running for president because uh, her job was to make sure that he didn't misrepresent the Church of the Latter-day Saints. You know, he was a Mormon. And so she was kind of like the, uh, I don't know, the muscle or something. I don't know, like, shh, quit saying that. That's not what we believe. I don't know, you know, exactly how that worked. But I guess he had to go through her if he wanted to say something religiously. I'm not sure. But here you have a whole host of people. I mean, a fast-growing religion. Millions of people are involved in it. They have their own Bibles. They have their own books that they say are as, mo as authoritative. But, folks, they are not the genuine article. They do not have the right standard. And so when they have their holy underwear on, which, by the way, they have that, and they're doing their two-year mission that they have to do, the BYU students, you'll notice some of their football players just disappear for two years. Where are they? They're out there doing their mandatory um, you know, uh, mission work. you got to appreciate the zeal. But just like we find with the children of Israel in Romans chapter 10, they have a zeal, but it's not according to knowledge. They don't submit themselves to the righteousness of God, but they go and try to create their own righteousness, which is what has been done. And so they're examining themselves, but what they're examining themselves by is not the right standard. Got to have the right standard. What do we mean by that? Isaiah 55, 8, 9. God just points straight out, my thoughts, you don't think like I do. Your thoughts are not my thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, thus saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, and my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You know, brethren, don't want to spend a lot of time with it, just want to make you feel bad like it does me when I think about it. <laughs> uh, probability. God knows probability. He knows what would happen if something went a different way. What do I mean by that? Do you remember what Jesus said? Woe unto you, Tyre. Woe unto you, Sidon. For if the mighty works which have been done in you had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, what does he say? They would have repented. So he knew that if they continued to do more works there and did the mighty works like they did later on in Tyre and Sidon, God knows the problem. They would have, some, they would have repented. Whereas this bunch of folks would not. So he knows the what if. What if this happened and this didn't happen? So God is... Not only does he, he doesn't think like we do. We don't know that. It's all we can do to deal with the things that are handed to us on a daily basis. And sometimes we don't do all that. Let me tell you a funny story on my wife. We're at home about 5 o'clock. 
she gets a text message from one of her friends that says, when you get this baby tonight, uh, see if you can keep that assignment for us tomorrow. This you know, stuff they do up there. And she says, well, what does she mean when I get this baby tonight? So guess where she's supposed to have been an hour ago? Yeah, you know, uh, she's supposed to have been at work. Didn't even know it. Don't know if she got added to the schedule or what. But, you know, it's hard to keep up with what we're supposed to be doing when we're supposed to be doing it individually. Individually. Now think about David, when the kids were growing up, was it hard to keep up with where everybody was going? Yeah. You got Susan going this way. You got uh, uh, that lady back there by Walker. Patty. There we go. You got Patty going that way, and you got Greg going another, and then you're, you're trying to figure out where'd Juan to go. I mean, that's just in our immediate families. God knows the entire world. And as Brother Duke was bringing out the other day, God was raising up nations. He was putting down nations. Sometimes it would take 400 years. He raised up Pharaoh to be as powerful a leader as he was so that he could bring him down and show the world his mighty power. Did he force Pharaoh's hand? No, he just made the situation where Pharaoh would do the things he wanted to do, which was be in control and, you know, to make slaves out of Israel. Uh, Pharaoh did what Pharaoh wanted to do, but God can do that without affecting our free will. He knows everybody at all times. We don't think like that. We do not think like that. So who are we to say, well, surely God would, folks, that's not your call. Ooh, man, that was thunder, wasn't it? Maybe some of that rain's coming through. Uh, that's not our call. You can't think for God. Number two, Proverbs 14, 12. There's a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. The Bible says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now, folks, baptism carries within it the idea of being immersed in water. I am positive, I'm sure, that the first priest that was called to this guy's house is dying. He's laying there, he's, man, he's withered up. He's, there's nothing hardly left of him. He's taking his last breaths. And somebody says, boy, it sure would be good for this fellow to be baptized. You know, maybe that poor fellow laying there is like, yeah, you know, I, I sure would like to have done that. And everybody's like, well, you can't move him. He's, maybe he's got broke bones. He, you can't move him. They're like, well, immersing this man in water is out of the question. I mean, it, he'll, he'll, you know, you, you're going to pick him. When you pick him up, he'll die. So somebody says, well, what if we baptize him right here? Well, somebody says, well, how are you going to do that? Well, the fellow says, well, i got a jug of water over here. We'll just pour it across him, and uh, that'll be immersion. That'll be, well, that'll be baptism. We'll call it a, a sacrament, if you will. Or some, and somebody probably thought, man, that's a good idea. Let's go ahead and do that. There's a way that seems right to, the man, to a man, but then there are the ways of death. What happened as a result of that? That's what all of them, everybody does. Folks, do you realize that we're some of the few people uh, that have an actual baptistry? Uh, I can't remember who it was, and I'm not trying to put anybody's family members down. I would never do that. But we had some uh, folks who had a funeral here, and somebody came up, and they wanted to see the baptistry. And, you know, and that just kind of struck me because I was going like, well, what y'all's baptistry look like? Why do you think ours looks any differently? And they were, we don't have a baptistry. And I was like, uh, Okay. You know, a lot of folks don't do that. And, you know, me, being in my little world of Baptist, bring up and member of the church, didn't realize some folks didn't do that. Why don't they do that? Don't need it. Got a bowl of water? Got a pitcher? Hey, stick your head over it. Whatever you do, don't drag your head across. You'll get water everywhere. They want to clean that up. Here's the towel. You know? And so they pour a little water over the head, and boom, you got baptism. No, you don't. But there is a way which seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. I'm sure the first time somebody thought, well, you know, that little baby was still born, we probably ought to baptize him. How are we going to do that? Well, let's sprinkle a little water on his head. Well, that ought to get it done. There's a way that might seem right to a man. What does God say? My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. They were trying to do right by the babies, trying to make sure they got into heaven. Folks, babies are fine. Wherever they got the idea that babies were not fine is they came up with some false doctrine, that you're born a little sinner. Not there. There's a way that seems right to a man, but then there are the ways of death. 2 Corinthians 10, 12, notice, brethren, boy, if there's something that we could, you don't have to put this verse to memory, but the concept to memory. Paul says, for we dare not make ourselves of the number. In other words, we don't want to be a part of this group. Well, what group is that, Paul? Who, and compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. We don't want to be a part of that group. Those who compare ourselves uh, with some that commend themselves. We don't want to be that. But they measuring themselves by themselves 
and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. What's he saying there? If I look at my life and then I look at this other old fellow over here, man, I, he, missed, uh, he missed the service last week. I hit all four of them, man. I got him there. Uh, I led an open prayer last week. Led singing twice last month. I was on the table. Uh, I prepared the Lord's Supper last year. And I start, what'd he do, you know? And so I start comparing myself to him, and I wonder how many folks he talked to about Jesus. You know, I talked to three people last week about Jesus. I'm looking pretty good. We can compare ourselves with other folks. First of all, we don't know what the other people are doing anyway. But we can do that, and somehow in our minds, we can get to the point where we think, well, I'm doing pretty good. Paul says, we don't want to be of that group. You don't want to do that. We've got one person who that we should be comparing ourselves to, and who's that? Who should we be emulating? The Lord Jesus Christ. And I tell you what, if you find yourself going, well, I look pretty good next to him, we probably need to talk because that is not the case. So Paul says, don't find yourself doing that. Don't compare yourself. You've got to have the right standard. John 12, 48, the Bible says, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my word hath one that judgeth him. Notice, the word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Folks, you got the rule book right in front of you. You know exactly how the judgment's going to go down. Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. We have to walk in the light as he is in the light. If we have done that and our spirit will uh, say with the Holy Spirit that we have done this, then you're in good shape. That's the standard. This is it. This is what you're going to judge yourself by. This is what Jesus is going to judge you by. The books were open and out of it in the book of life. They were judged out of the books. The books are complete. And uh, we have to judge ourselves by the right standard. And the right standard is the word that Jesus has spoken. That's going to be what judges us. Next one. I think, brethren, probably one of the, well, it's, it's absolute key ingredient. You can't be right without it. You've got to be honest. You've got to be honest with the Scripture. When the Bible lays something at your feet, you've got to deal with it right. It's not going to go away. The Bible hasn't changed 2,000 years. We got a lot of brethren and a lot of folks out there trying to change the Bible, trying to tell you that certain things that used to be sins aren't sins now. You know, well, that, that was then. This is now. You know, standard hadn't changed. We got to be honest with them. Notice Numbers 32, 23. Moses says, But if you will not do so, behold, you have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. You're not going to be outrun, able to outrun your sin. Be honest with it. Fess up to it. That's the only way you're going to get rid of it. Confess your faults one to another, James 5, verse 16. Get rid of it. Give it to God. Repent of it. Psalms 51. Uh, notice David, he handled his. He repented of it. He prayed that God would take it away. 1 John 1, 8 through 10. If we say that we have no sin, what are we doing? We're absolutely deceiving ourselves. If we think that we are somehow above sin, John says you're deceiving yourself. The truth's not in it. Why would he even make a statement like that? Remember, John is basically dealing with that Gnostic idea that flesh is evil, spirit's good. And when your body sins, it's not really you. It's your spirit is fine. Your body's sinning. And the two are different. That's how you get once saved, always saved, and things like that. That's what I was taught. Brethren, I'm telling you, in 19, when I was 10 years old, uh, I remember it vividly. Uh, what would that have been? About 100 years ago. Um, 1974. I was taught, Chattanooga, Tennessee, that your soul and your spirit, uh, I mean, your body and your spirit are different. And when your body does something, it does not go against, it does not account to your soul. And that's just flat-out Gnosticism. That is just wrong. When I sin, I sin, folks. This body sins just because this mind told it to do it. This spirit told it to do it. The Bible, John here, is combating that. He's the one that talks about the Antichrist. And who is the Antichrist? Those that deny that Christ came in the flesh. And there are many in the first century, and there's many today. And what's a bad, a lot of times, they call themselves Christians and deny that Jesus came in the flesh. It says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth's not in us. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Notice the last verse. If we say we have not sinned, what are we doing? We make him a liar. Notice in verse 8, if we say no, we, we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. But it gets worse. If we say we have not sinned, we're making God a liar. And the word is not in us. So be honest. Be honest with it. Proverbs 28, 13. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper. 
people are just not going to be able to hide it under a blank. God knows, or hide it under a blanket or something. God's going to see it. God knows. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them, he shall have mercy. Get out in front of it, I guess is what we would say. You know, don't, don't try to hide it. Get, deal with it. Maybe something you're ashamed of. If it's something that's personal, then, you know, you deal with that. Get help for it. But don't uh, just act like it's going to go away. Don't act like that you can just hide it and no one will ever know because God knows. Last but not least, uh, the examination of ourselves must be thorough. It's got to be thorough. What do we mean by that? Well, Psalms 139, verses uh, 23 and 24. Let's take a look. Psalms 139, 23 and 24. The psalmist would say, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way, uh, in the way everlasting. What's that saying? Search me, God. Let me know. Let me. And how would you do that? How would you find out? You're you're trying to figure out. Am I doing what God would have me to do? Folks, you're going to spend time with the book. You're going to spend time. You're going to know what sin is. You're going to have to know what sin is and say, Is it, am I doing this? There's several places that even categorize sin. First Corinthians chapter six, uh, Galatians chapter five. Romans chapter 1. And they show us that certain things I don't need to be doing in my life. They're those things that probably your parents even warned you about. And your conscience stings you a little bit when you're doing it. We need to stay away from those things. We need to stay away from those things and know and that God knows our thoughts and will help us with those very things. Notice Hebrews 6 1. Now, back in chapter 5, he says, When the time is called to be teachers, you have one need to teach you again. The, first principles of oracles of God, he kind of gets after them pretty good. Chapter 6, continuing that thought, remember there's no chapter separation in the uh, actual scriptures themselves. Those are done just for us to find easier. Hebrews 6, 1, therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on into being whole, perfection, full grown, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and the faith toward God. We've got to grow. This growth, this examination must be continual and we don't need to be re-examining, you know, well, did I repent? I mean, those are good questions to ask, but we need to get to a point where we say, yeah, I did that, and move on into the weightier matters uh, of being a Christian and, and full growth of a Christian. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14. We, I know we're familiar with verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the matter. This is Solomon winding down this letter where he's been looking at everything and he says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep his commandments. Know this is the whole the word duty there should be in italics or something. When I bring it over in the PowerPoint, it changes that italics. But uh, this is the whole of man, the whole duty of man. It doesn't stop there. This is the last verse of this letter. It says, for God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Got to look through the scripture. We've got to make sure our life's in accordance with his will. Don't try to cover it up. Deal with it. Confess it. If, you're, and if you've never become a Christian, then obey the gospel. Have all your past sins washed away and then begin that walk of being clean, that white, shiny robe, if you will. And then walk in that life. So when you do make those errors of judgment and those mistakes, that that'll be washed away. If it's something of a public nature that you've done and, and you need to then you need to deal with it publicly. But all of us, all of, from thoughts to actions, that we may find out later, hey, that's wrong. I shouldn't have been doing that. Well, then we need to we do better and improve upon that because God is going to bring every work into judgment. And then last but not least, James 4, 1, 4. But let patience have her perfect work. You are not going to be uh, an elder the day after you obey the gospel. It's just not going to happen. You're going to have to mature. You're going to have to grow you're going to have to know more, understand more, and then you're going to have to know more about life. And boy, the, all of us here can attest. I mean, most of us of any age whatsoever, just when you think you're getting a fastball, the bottom drops out of that thing, and you figure out, guess what? That was a slider, or uh, if you're like me, it's, bless your heart, it's a change-up, and you've already swung three times before the ball gets there, you know? Uh, it just changes. It changes and as you go through these different things you go through, it's called patience. You learn to develop patience. Well, if you don't, you get old real fast. But you've got to learn that, that uh, and that's one of the reasons that elders, well, they've got to have a family. Because guess what? That close family unit, that close unit we call a family, 
if there's anything in this world that's going to work that patience, man, that's it. Because that's the people we live with. That's the people we do life with. And so an elder needs to have a family. He needs to have that experience of raising children. He needs to have the heartache of having those children break his heart because they did something that he's trained them their whole life not to do. They need that experience because in the congregation, guess what? Now you're dealing with people, and they're going to do things sometimes. You're like, well, I know you knew better. You know, why did you do that? And lo and behold, you've already dealt with that in the family life. So you know all people say, why do they all got to have family? Because you learn things in family. You learn patience. You also learn you don't discard people when they make that one mistake, do you? Why? Well, that's my family. That's my son. That's my daughter. That's my, you know, grandson, granddaughter, whatever. You don't just discard them. They make a mistake. And the elders, they learn that. And members of the congregation, when they make mistakes, they, well, they're going to make mistakes. You don't discard them. You do just like you do with your children. You encourage them to do what's right. You encourage them to live the life that they should. You let patience have a perfect work, that you may be perfect and tired, wanting nothing. Because life, life's going to come at you. It's going to come at you hard. And the only way you can be ready is to have these examinations we've been looking at. Notice very quickly, it's got to be personal. It's got to be about me. Can't be judging the other guy. Boy, it's easy to look at him going like, boy, he needs to do this, that, and yeah, What about me? It's got to be personal. It's got to be continual. Can't just do it once and say, hey, I'm done. It's all the time. Got to have the right standard. Word of God must be honest. Honesty, man, that's such a... You know, we talked about that this morning. The Pharisees, what were they doing? Underhanded, hiring people if they needed to, to get them to lie, get them to do whatever they could to try to do what they wanted. They were political, if you will. They used politics. They used power. They used money. They used influence. They used family names. They've worked behind the scenes in the dark, in the secret, where just Satan's doing all this diabolical scheming. And what was Jesus? Right out there in front of everybody. When they came to arrest him, he says, why are you coming out here in the middle of the night like you're arresting the thief? I've never said anything that I, in, the, in the night that I hadn't said during the day. I taught you openly right there in your temples. Why didn't you arrest me then? See, he was open, and he was honest. A lot of people don't like that. Last but not least, got to be thorough. Got to take a look at it all. Am I what I ought to be? Am I doing what God would have me to be? Examine ourselves, brother. Let's don't ever get to the point where we think we're above that self-examination. Point of plan of salvation. Got to know it. We've got to have it. It's got to be a part of what we are. It's what we do as a people. We try to encourage other folks. You need to become a Christian. Well, how do you do that? Well, you got to come to the fact and understanding that there's a God. He had a son. He sent him to this earth, die for our sins. Carl, that's the good news. Why? Because there's some bad news. If you don't take advantage of that, see that place we talked about this morning, the hell, the devil's hell, a place not prepared for you, don't want to go, no reason to go there, God's done all this. Hear that, hear the good news. If you believe it, act upon it, repenting, confessing Jesus' name before men, that indeed you believe he's the Son of God and that God has raised him from the dead, Romans 10, 9 and 10, and then be baptized for the remission of your sins. The Lord will add you to the church. It's that simple. The Lord adds you to the church, not man on some roll. We don't have a roll book. We got a directory back there with Ricky. I'd imagine it probably needs update too, don't Rick? But uh, we, <laughs> that's certainly not the Lamb's Book of Life. We don't say who's going to be saved, who's not. That, we're not your judge. God is your judge. It'll be written in that Lamb's Book of Life. And then notice we have faithful unto death. That's what we've been talking about tonight, examining ourselves, making sure that we're walking in the light as he is in the light. If you're here tonight, we can help you in any way. We encourage you to come as together we stand and sing.